Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Resume Essentials with the Sigma Chi Career Advantage. My name is Leslie Nichols, and I am the Associate Director of Member Engagement for Sigma Chi Fraternity. And on behalf of the Member Engagement Committee, we are excited to welcome you to this um, event tonight as part of the signature series within the Career Conversation. Um, we are excited to have you joining us from wherever you are, so we invite you to post and comment in the comments box in the chat where you're tuning in from, what chapter you're tuning in from, um, as well as if you have any questions about the content that we reviewed tonight, we invite you to, to post those as well, and we will do our best with our time to get to those. Um, speaking of our time tonight, I am pleased to introduce our guest speaker for the evening, Paul Flournoy. Paul joined the Rubicon Founders Talent Team in 2023 with an interest in accessible healthcare options. Prior to joining Rubicon, Paul's background was in higher education and career coaching. He was a STEM career coach at Vanderbilt University and a program coordinator at Duke University's Fuqua School of Business. Paul comes from an innovative entrepreneurial family, so he jumped at the chance to uh, change fields from higher education to healthcare. Paul enjoys walking his Basset Hound George and is an avid Philadelphia sports fan, as well as an alumni of Sigma Chi from Furman University. Paul, welcome. Thanks, Leslie. Appreciate you having me and, and everyone tuning in as well. Uh, thanks for that kind introduction. Really excited to chat with you all today about um, resumes and getting those building. For, for those of you who are joining from uh, classes in the start of the school year, um, I hope the school year is starting off well for you. Really excited to dive into some of this content. Uh, before we get into it, just want to acknowledge if you have questions further than resumes or um, about different fields for that matter, you're welcome to reach out to me through LinkedIn. So feel free to find me, uh, send me an invite, happy to chat. We'll set up a time to chat chat uh, sometime soon, but yeah, looking forward to, to diving in. So on average, uh, how long do hiring managers spend reviewing resumes initially? It's kind of a interesting fact that uh, it's only about seven seconds. It's really quick. They're really trying to dive into how does it look? What experiences do they have? And is there anything that jumps out of the page initially. Really what they're looking to do is get you connected early on um, with the position specifically. And so uh, the more you can cater it, the better. And that's kind of what we're we're going to talk about. So uh, what should a strong resume do? It should be well organized. It should be highlight your skills uh, and be concise and easy to read. So with that uh, as well, it's a part of the seven seconds, right? So if you're taking a look at your resume and after a few seconds, you don't get a general theme. That's a good feel for, hey, I need to, to boost this resume up. I need to, to make some changes. So uh, that initial glare, that initial look that you or a friend or a family member might have of the document is really important. So the challenge uh, with resume education and a little bit about today as well. And the first is very subjective uh, to you, the creator, as well as the reviewer. Um, if you are asking me to take a look at your resume, um, I might know you personally, I might know you professionally. And so of course I might glare at some of the experiences or some of the tasks and say, hey, you've done a great job here. Um, that's a good way of uh, overseeing some of those experiences. It's also uh, hard to get the various industry practices uh, and experiences and all the changes in the different industry um, experiences to, to be concise and, and direct at the same time. Uh, and with that as well, deep dive versus high level overview, you wanna make sure you have both on your resume. Um, and again, keeping it very concise, keeping it clear, all of these things make it pretty challenging to build that resume at the start uh, or make some of those edits or comments. So we'll dive into some of that content in a little bit. But in terms of what should go on your resume, um, really three main sections, um, or excuse me, uh, criteria is first going to be that formatting. That goes back to what we've been talking about initially, that clear, concise, direct seven seconds. Um, the sections, that's going to be pretty neat and decisive for uh, what are we going to have on there and how do you distinctly describe what you've been able to uh, accomplish so far. And, and you do that description through those bullet points as well. Those action bullets, I would say probably the hardest part of building a resume. Uh, and we'll definitely give you some tips and tricks on that. 
So in terms of formatting, um, you really want it to be one column. I know sometimes you'll see, oh, it'll be easier if I separate on the left-hand side. I think the Word document does a format that way. Um, have your skills and contact information and then experiences on the right. We'll want one column. And a big part of that is you're actually able to get more content there. Um, you want to have balanced white space. And what that means is, you know, between your action bullets and your dates, you want to make sure that there's a little bit of separation there. You want to make sure that it is consistent between sections and that you don't have two spaces between one section and the other, and then three between another part of the resume. The font, the font size, color, 10 to 12 point font, just basic font as well, black color, just uh, very neat there, I'd say. 10 point font is probably the smallest you'd be able to get. Uh, for those of you who are four eyed like myself, it gets a little bit challenging after that uh, to take a look at the experiences that you have. And a, a big part of formatting as well is, you know, sometimes with one inch margins that Word documents generally give you, it, it can get a little tight. Um, but you can go ahead and, and separate that out to about half inch margins is, is probably a pretty good uh, size to have that as well. Um, apply diverse formatting tactics. So if you have a particular skill, if it's a technical skill, like you've used Java for a particular project and you want to highlight in your action bullet that you use Java for that particular task, make sure you bold that um, or italicize. So that way in those seven seconds, you're, you're glancing through the resume and your eye immediately goes towards something that's distinguished. No graphic elements, no charts, images, no pictures of yourself. We'll keep it just text on the document, sometimes in different fields, like um, with graphic design, you might have a separate portfolio. It's okay to link to that, uh, but we wanna make sure that it's, it's just text for the resume. Uh, and all left and right alignments are matching. We wanna make sure everything is fluid and, and concise through the entire document. What does that come together to look like? Uh, Leslie, I think, has a, a good example resume here uh, posted um, or is able to be shared as a resource for Sigma Chi. Um, and so as you see here, it's, it's balanced in terms of white space. It's consistent in that as well. Good use of diverse formatting elements. So you see the sections are separated. You see the clear position title and clear uh, action bullets for each distinct experience as well. Uh, one column lines are mostly filled. It's okay if your action bullet doesn't go all the way over to the, the right margin, right? We want to make sure that we're concise and direct still. Uh, if it's three or four words in a bullet, I'd probably say you need more details. But again, you're welcome to have a little bit of space between the location and the dates that you were there on the right hand side with the bullets on the left. Um, and then again, easy to read. The font is same throughout. If you're glancing at this uh, from a, a big picture overview, you're able to see it's, it's, it's very direct. It's very concise. Some things to, to maybe work on or, or notice here, the, the name at the top could definitely be a little bit bigger. We don't want it dominating the, the header of the document, but we want to make sure that they're able to see your name. Of course, that's a big part of that introduction there. Um, and then you want to consider potentially different formatting elements for section, section headers. Uh, you're welcome to play around with the format. Uh, one thing that we like to say is it's not a one size fit all document, right? So your resume may look very different from my resume in terms of the formatting, but the general feel for this overview and, and why the document shared here on the slide is a, a, a full document. I know you can probably not see the specific words in it, um, but it's just so you can get that initial seven second glance here. So let's get into a little bit about the sections. Like, what am I looking for? What are we looking for if we're trying to build, say it's a, a zero to one resume build for you. First is gonna be that header. You wanna make sure um, that you have your contact information up there, education, uh, professional work experience, additional involvement if applicable. Uh, this kind of blends in with projects as well and skills, certifications, languages, these are the things that we'll talk about through the rest of this presentation and as well as you might have questions afterwards as well. Um, you're welcome to use the chat there uh, and I'll, I'll try to help answer those during this time. But again, if not, you're welcome to after. But starting with the header, um, what you want to do is use the name you prefer to be called. So I have friends who go by their middle name uh, and not their first name. 
you're welcome to put that middle name, last name on there. However you would prefer to be called. Think if I were to call you out of the blue, how would you prefer I refer to you? Uh, you're also welcome to put your pronouns on there if you would like. It's definitely optional, but for those of you who want to add those. For the location, only city state uh, is fine. You don't want your full address on there. The reason you might see some of that content floating around the internet is, you know, back in the day, we used to mail applications in. Um, we're not doing that anymore. So there's no need to have any of that uh, up on your resume. Uh, they'll definitely be able to find you. And a big thing with the city state is uh, you want to make sure that it's closest to the employer. And what I mean by this is as you might be at a university or a college, that's not close to home. Uh, for example, I'm from North Carolina. I live in Nashville. If I was applying to a job uh, in, we'll call it Kentucky, I'd rather use my Vanderbilt address in Nashville because I am here majority of the time. And as I'm sending in applications, that is where I can accept mail if, should they need to find me. What employers will use that for is, hey, if it's, if it's between Paul and Mark for a potential position, but Paul is closer, that could be the deciding factor. Oftentimes it's not gonna get that granular, but it definitely helps an employer see, oh, okay, Paul's local or can easily get here versus uh, if I'm applying for a job in Portland, Oregon, and I live in North Carolina, um, it might be a little bit more challenging. Uh, that's not to say, discourage you from applying to those roles. But if you do have two locations that you spend your time, you're welcome to use one, whichever is closer. Uh, on your personal email, uh, this is one just first last name. We want it clear and professional. Uh, we don't want to have I'm a rock star drummer at gmail.com. We'll want to make sure it is very clear, uh, distinct uh, and professional as well. Your .edu email, some universities and colleges will take that email away from you and you won't have access forever. And so we don't want to get that loss as you'll be applying to different uh, experiences. And you want to include the shortened LinkedIn URL or your website. If you have a potential website, again, going back to the graphic design experience, maybe you have an online portfolio. You're welcome to link those in the header as well. If you don't know how to edit your LinkedIn URL, it's at the top right portion of your profile page. It'll say edit public profile and URL, and you can change that up there and get rid of the, the random letters and numbers. So going into the education uh, a little bit and what that section means, you want to make sure you include the university or college that you're at, the degree you have, um, and major. And so what that means is you want to make sure you have Bachelor of Arts in X. Um, and so you also have your graduation date. We'll get into the specifics of what that looks like, but the graduation date can definitely be May 2024, I guess we're at now. Um, and so the location of the university is optional. Um, no need to include the College of Business unless you particularly know somebody that's going to be more of uh, a networking connection point that you can include there. You only want to include your GPA uh, if it's over 3.5 or uh, you're on the dean's list. Another thing to include your GPA on, on the resume would be if there is a requirement of, hey, only applicants with a 3.0 or higher. If you have a 3.2, by all means, put your GPA on there because that will definitely show, hey, I'm above that threshold. 3.5 and above is just a general uh, rule of thumb, but really it's one that as long as you're comfortable and confident in, uh, you're welcome to put on there. Employers generally won't need to see that GPA. If they do need to see it, they'll have that on the job description. Um, or if you don't have it on the resume and they need to see it, they'll just ask for it. So uh, by no means is not having your GPA on there a red flag. And then in terms of relevant coursework, you want to make sure that the courses are ones that you have completed or will have completed by the time that you start the experience. Um, the ones that are relevant to the job or the industry, the ones we want to make sure that we focus on, because I know you're probably taking, um, you know, four to six classes a semester. And as you get to be a junior, senior, third year, fourth year, it starts to really pile up there. And so what that looks like um, in practice, a little bit closer so you can see that full document here. Uh, you've got city, city university, your degree, uh, your GPA is on there. And then any honors and award as well. Something I want to make sure that we note here that um, that I didn't mention earlier as well is everything through a document is going to be reverse chronological order. And so what that means is 
each section it's going to reset, but you want the most recent experience on top. So it's easy to see where you are now and where you have been as well. Um, that's that's definitely something to, to keep in mind. So in terms of what's what's positive here, um, all elements are present. And then the formatting is there to help items stand out as well. So your degree is separated with italicies and your GPA as well. It's separated to a clean, consistent format. Um, some things to maybe keep an eye out for is uh, to not italicize the major in particular, um, but also ACT scores. Once you're at a college or university, there's no need to um, have that on there. Uh, the 4.0 is the general assumed uh, grade scale. So feel free to take the out of 4.0 on there. So uh, just the GPA 3.69 will be applicable. And then expected for grad year. Sometimes we'll see that where it'll say expected May 2023. And the big part of having that is maybe, oh, I, I, am, I might take a fifth year. Um, if that might change, feel free to change it to May 2024 when you get there. But nothing's assumed. Um, and so it's not necessarily a must have that you are done in four years or show that you think you're going to be done at a particular time. Just put that date on there. So moving on to the professional experience. So this experience we all want to make sure is relevant work experience. Um, I know as you get to the, be the junior, senior, third year, fourth year, you probably have a ton of different experiences uh, ranging from working in a smoothie shop to uh, being a project management intern, right? And so as your resume does get longer, we want to make sure that those experiences stay relevant. And again, re reverse chronological order. Include that job title, the company, city, state, time of employment as well, month and year. Uh, there might be some questions around, oh, I worked at um, as a lifeguard for these two summers, um, but not in between. And you can work around that. There are ways to shift to show that it was just for the summers. You wanna make sure that those bullet points um, design are just the simple dots like you see here on this slide. Um, one thought per line, one phrase uh, as well. We wanna make sure that it's not a multi-sentence bullet, Whatever you have to say will be able to be said in one line um, specifically. Again, going back to that reverse chronological order, most recent on top. Um, and then, of course, remove anything prior to college or unless relevant. That's a big piece as well. Um, sometimes you get the question of, well, I had this um, debate team experience and I want to go be a lobbyist. Great. That might be relevant. Feel free to have it on there. Uh, the biggest thing when I was working with students directly was if you're able to convince me why I should have that on there, keep it on there. I'm not the one to sit there and say that's a relevant experience or not. I want to make sure that you're able to tell me why it's relevant. And then by all means, it's your resume. It's your experience. And so what that looks like is something like this. Um, and this will be a consistent theme you see through the rest of this document um is the clear concise no need for spaces between the bullets and the next experience um the one line per bullet something i get questions about as well is the period at the end of the bullets um you don't necessarily need to have periods uh, on your resume but if you do you want to make sure that it's on there for every single bullet um and something that i like to say is you know it's easier to see if there is a period on there that shouldn't be versus if you're missing a period but again, if that's something that you need, you feel for, go go ahead and throw that period at the end of the bullets there. Um, you want to make sure that there's not too many bullets under each entry. So if you have five things to talk about at Product Company Inc., uh, I would say pick the best three or four if there's not five things you have for every other experience, which once you get to five bullet points per experience, you're going to get towards the end of that one page document pretty quickly. Um, so make sure that you're staying between three and five, I'd call it, as a general rule of thumb, but we want to make sure it's not dominated by one in particular. Um, so moving on to additional involvements and in projects, this is when we can get a little bit more creative and where your resume might start to stand out from some of your peers. Um, volunteering, research, extracurricular activities. Um, these are all different examples of what you can title this particular section. So. This could be research experience or volunteer experience or extracurricular experience. Leadership and involvement is another one I see. Um, you want to make sure that it's still, again, relevant to that job. If you haven't been able to see that theme so far, 
Uh, it should be showcasing your skills, your employability, and also to fill space. Again, we want to have that page be one, uh, one page in full. And so this is a great way to add, hey, you know, I, I did work at the animal shelter, uh, which shows X, Y, and Z skill and might be related to this internship that I'm looking for. Um, and so what that looks like in practice here is going to be here, research experience, that leadership experience, again, very similar to what that work experience it might look like. Uh, this is something you can play around with, though, if you want to have multiple leadership experiences, it's OK to have kind of one line per experience and then describe that in full through an interview or through maybe an essay prompt they might have on the application as well. Um, but this is just to show you a little bit about what additional experiences could look like and what the bullet points should kind of stand out to be as well. Make sure you have correct verb tense um, to your entry date. So what that means is if the experience is current or ongoing, all bullets will be in present tense format. Uh, now, a big stick there is, you know, maybe I completed this task or I finished this project, but I'm still working there or volunteering here or researching is where I see the primary bulk. That action verb would still be present tense if you are still in that lab at that volunteer site. Uh, make sure it's consistent. Uh, but if you are completed with the experience, go ahead and put everything in past tense. That's when you'll switch it over. You'll want to make sure that the strong action verbs stand out. You want to avoid that repetition. So managed is one that's kind of overused. Um, supervised, I see every once in a while. So make sure that you're diversifying. It's okay to have similar action verbs in different sections. But I would say if you've used it in one experience, maybe hold off on using it twice in the same experience. But again, it's your document. And I don't want to say through five bullets, you're going to be able to particularly kind of separate that. Um, and so use your best judgment is a good, good piece there. But overall for action bullets, I would call it a three part statement. First, it's going to be the action, which is the action verb, how you start each bullet. The context, this is where you get into the meat and the potatoes. What are you trying to tell me here? And the result, what is the reason for what you did? What came out of the work that you produced? And so a little bit of an exercise that has been used in the past um, or what it looks like putting it together uh, might be something like this. So the action verbs underlined, uh, the squiggly lines is the context and then the results circled there. So sometimes we'll see that there is no result posted. That's probably the most common uh, mistake that we see or missed opportunity, I'll call it. Um, and so we have uh, an opportunity for resumes to be reviewed and looked at. This is a little bit around some of the comments you, you might see if you uh, use our services, if you go to your university or college career center. Um, this is what sometimes the, um, the revi revisor is uh, looking for. Um, and the biggest thing with that is you want to make sure that your main point is highlighted uh, through that bullet. So the overall theme is produced for that particular experience. Um, and then going back to that experience and what that looks like in full, strong action verbs, no repetition, context in every point, there's a reason for it being there. Uh, so with that, we want to make sure that if you are sharing your resume with me, if you are looking over it yourself before you share it with me and you say, you know, I'm not sure if Paul's going to get that I want marketing experience here uh, showcased, I'm probably not going to see that. I'm not going to make any assumptions about the experiences you have. I'm going to take it at face value, especially before we talk. So we want to make sure that every bullet point has context and a specific purpose. If you're reading it and saying, you know, it's fairly general or this highlights something that another bullet also highlights, it probably does. Uh, so make sure you take a look at that and revise it. Doesn't mean you have to totally remove it. Some things to take a look at, uh, condensed extra information. Uh, in city university. So some of those bullets, that first one in particular, could be a little bit shorter. Uh, something with getting, getting action bullets a little shorter, I call it removing the fluff. So sometimes if you see two or that or the, you can remove some of those fluff words to get the sentence itself shorter. But it's a tricky game because we want to make sure that we're not um, removing any of that context that you might want to have. So then going into the skills, certifications, language, languages, excuse me, honors, and et cetera, um, for those experiences, for the skills, 
you want to make sure that you want to have hard skills only. Um, so those might be technical languages, lab techniques, things that maybe a job description would have. I would say use a position description as kind of a, a toolkit for you to say, what experiences do I have to match this? Or what experiences or skills do I have uh, are amplified from this position description? Include the proficiency level of skills languages. So oftentimes, if you're taking a language at university or, or college that you're at, make sure that you say elementary or conversational or fluent, because that distinction can mean a lot to an employer. Uh, if you're trying to work in a particular region that might speak uh, another language as well, that that could be definitely helpful and something that uh, they would take into consideration as well. Include um, the certifications date as well, the provider and a brief description, the relevant skills of what that means. Not everyone's going to understand what every single uh, certification is or means. So make sure that you give that uh, description. And as an example here, it's going to look a little different, right? We probably don't have action bullets to your experience or your certifications, excuse me. Um, another thing that could happen, again, going back to similarly, if you have a ton of volunteer experiences for your certifications, it could be a one liner of a brief description on the same line with your date. Um, but that's going to be super condensed if we really need that space back. Uh, but just to give you a quick look, this is what that's going to look like. For skills and interests, this will go generally at the bottom of your resume. Uh, what you can also do is put it between education and your experiences. Generally, I see this in more technical roles, um, computer software roles as well. Um, that's going to be more so the technical languages are going to be more so important if you know and have used them before. But this is what that section is going to look like. It's formatted well, it's condensed, it's very specific as well, and it's sectioned off into what you want the employer to see. So it's okay to have uh, three or four skills defined, but what we don't wanna have is just skills in a straight line. I might not know what a particular skill is that you have on there. So as long as you're putting that description of what space that lives in, it's gonna be helpful as well. Another question that I get often is the objective statement. Uh, and I think a big part of that is a lot of online uh, blogs will have, hey, this is, this is the time to shine. This is where you tell everyone what you've been able to do. I'd say not necessarily. Uh, if you're an undergraduate student, there's not too much you'll be able to put there that we don't want you to have in your action bullets. We want your action bullets to serve as that description. Um, you want to keep it brief and skills focused if you do. And, and brief means maybe two, three sentences max. Um, and so make sure that if you do want to have that on there, it does serve a specific purpose. Just to round it out, um, resume best practices here. Um, do not rely on AI chat GPT. It's okay to use it. And I would say like there's some value in having it. Um, but we wanna make sure that if you do go through, sometimes it'll generalize or change those experiences. Um, and so you wanna make sure that it is still tailored to you specifically. So if you do use an online platform, uh, to kind of refine or build your resume. You want to make sure that you read through it before you submit it or send it to somebody professionally. Um, and also with that, you never want to lie on your resume. They'll figure it out uh, one way or the other, whether they hear from someone else that uh, you haven't had that experience or they find out when you're on the job. Either way, it's not going to end up well. So just go ahead and keep everything that you have been able to do and showcase what your potential is versus what you haven't done uh, and highlighting that. You can read through the rest of these here, but uh, the a few quick things are always use a PDF format. And a big reason for that is if you send a, a Word doc and say I open it up, that gives me the chance to change or delete something on your resume and say, nope, it wasn't there. Um, so you want to make sure that you send that PDF format so it is your copy. Um, avoid jargon unless cited in the job description, including Sigma Chi terms. If, you know, if you were console, say president, that's okay. They're not going to know what console might mean. Uh, and so you want to make sure that you're describing uh, the position and the experiences itself specifically. Uh, even if you are applying to a position where you know the recruiter is a Sigma guy like myself, um, you want to make sure that you are being very specific to what that position might have been. 
use your career center on your campus. That's a little bit biased on my end, but they are extremely helpful and they are there for a reason. And they do want to help. Um, and so even if you aren't sure on what questions you want to ask or what should you ask, uh, it's a great place to go and, and start that conversation. Um, and with that as well, the final piece, submitting a cover letter. Um, that's something that not all employers will look at a cover letter. But what I always say is I would hate for the reason that you didn't get a position or an interview for a position because you did not submit a cover letter. So if there's ever an option to, it's a quick one page document. I'm sure we'll have workshops and conversations around building a cover letter, but it's it's another way to kind of advocate, advocate for yourself and, and build that case that you are the right fit for the role and you would add value to that position and to the organization. And I think from there, we have a few questions that Leslie's going to help us out with. Yeah, yeah. So the first one here is, how can I address gaps in my employment history or, you know, career changes if your experience doesn't align with a job you're currently applying for? Yeah, it's a great question. I'll, I'll start with the gap in experiences. Um, a big piece of being an undergraduate is okay to say, like, hey, I was in classes during that August to May time period. Um, if there is a gap in regards to a summer, what I would say is that's a great opportunity to highlight potential project or initiative that you worked on, right? So that might come by way of, I didn't have an internship this summer, but I you know, worked out on a farm um, helping my family. You can still talk about that experience on there, what you were able to to, to do. Um, and so gaps on resumes, I would, I would say, there's nothing that you can do to hide it if you did absolutely nothing, but you change that through conversation as well. So, you know, say you spent the summer hanging out with family and going on vacation and traveling, that's okay, That's you're a human, you should enjoy those times off. Um, but what I would say is then if, if you were chatting with me about that, is gonna be, tell me what you did do. Did you take initiative to do more reading on a particular industry? Did you learn anything? Um, did you build your, build your network? Um, so if there's ever an opportunity to talk about what you were able to accomplish, that's going to be uh, what you want to do. And also cover letters is a great time to do that. If you know that there's a gap on your resume, it's hard to just reach out and say, hey, Paul, there's a gap in my resume. Don't worry about it. Um, mm -hmm. I would recommend doing is using the cover letter for that in saying, addressing, not saying, I know there's a gap in my resume. Let me tell you about it it would potentially serve as a, you know, over the summer of 2023, I had the opportunity to shadow, or I had the opportunity to build my network and have conversations. And that's what solidified my interest in working in healthcare, um, whatever that might be. And I'm sorry, Leslie, you're gonna have to uh, remind me what the second part of that was. Yeah, I think the second part was just about, you know, if the experience that you have on your resume isn't the exact same as the career, you know, industry that you're looking for. Totally. Find as many connection points as you can. That connective tissue is going to be massive to be in your favor. Again, that cover letter is going to be a huge help as well. Um, a big part of being in college is trying new things, trying new experiences. So don't change the experiences you've had that might get into the chat GPT world where you might say, you know, turn my uh, philosophy experience into healthcare. It just doesn't work like that. Um, but any connection you're able to find to the organization itself and the work they do to the tasks and what you would be doing on a day to day basis of a potential position, that's where you're going to find that connection. Um, not necessarily industry to industry. I'd say industry changes happen all the time, uh, mm -hmm. specifically in between your major and going into that first role or going into the first few roles after school. Um, it's not as you know granular as it's a totally different world. It's going to be what have you done to make you successful here? Yeah, that's awesome. We've got another one coming up here about dean's lists and scholarships. Should that go in the education section? Or should that be in the skills or, or scholarships or awards section? Yeah, for sure. I would say that can go in the education section if you have a few of those experiences and you want to just kind of quick glance through them. Mm -hmm. If you want to give more of a description, I would I would go ahead and put it in that certifications toward the bottom. What I see most common in education is, you know, if you had dean's list every semester or if you had dean's list for one semester, Dean's list would go next to GPA um, and then scholarships, I would say, 
if they are nationally recognized scholarships, it's okay to put in the education. If they are school specific, maybe an award that you won that goes towards tuition, that's probably one you want to describe, right? That can almost mm -hmm. be an experience. If it's an essay contest, if it's a particular project or research that you did that led to it, you can talk about that. That can go even in uh, additional uh, information as well and have bullets for it. Yeah, awesome. And, and final question, just kind of tying it all together. Can grabbing coffee or lunch to network really help set you apart in the, the job application process? Yeah, great question, William Patterson. Um, definitely can help through the process. Uh, if you are able to grab a coffee, make that connection um, initially, that's going to help you get through, I'd say, a few hoops of that application process. Uh, so if you're able to connect with them, if you're local, it always helps. And you never know who they know. A big part of networking is their network will then become your network as well. So if you have the chance, William, I would definitely say go for it. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you, Paul, so much for joining us this evening and sharing all of your knowledge with, with all of our members about the, the resume process. I'm really excited that this session gets to live forever on our Simakai Learning Consortium as well as, you know, stored on LinkedIn. So I'm hopeful that this will be helpful for members in years to come. And we're, we're very grateful for that expertise that, that you bring here. Thanks, Leslie. Appreciate your time. And thanks, everyone, for joining in. Again, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. And I'm always open to a conversation. So if you want to um, connect with me, we can we can try to find a time on the books to, to chat. Yeah. And speaking of connecting, we do have a couple of upcoming opportunities to engage even further with the Sigma Chi Career Advantage. Um, so we will be offering a, the fall resume review, which we um, piloted last year. So be on the lookout the end of September, early October. Be checking your emails and our social media channels to find out more about how you can have your resume reviewed by our team of alumni reviewers. With that, we'll thank you all so much for joining us this evening and good luck with the start of the year.